Again, good to see each one here this morning. And uh, didn't have an outline for you. If I'd have made an outline and got it to them in time, it wouldn't have been any good because I changed it all this morning anyway. <laughs> so uh, glad I didn't make one so in, that, in that respect. Uh, but my original title was, What is Faith? But then I used the scripture, Hebrews 11 and 1. You can turn there, Hebrews 11 and 1. And uh, faith, the Bible, God's Word gives us the definition of faith uh, right in the Bible. So if my title was, uh, What is Faith? And then I read Hebrews 11 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Well, my sermon would be over, wouldn't it? What is faith? There's what faith is. But you know, sometimes you ever looked up anything in the in a dictionary and you didn't know exactly what the word meant and you looked it up and you read what it meant and you had to look up that word and then you had to look up that word and finally you come up on a word then you start looking into synonyms, you know, and you try to figure out what's that word. Well, uh, now the definition here of faith in Hebrews is, is it is exactly right but it's not just as simple as that. It's not... Uh, really that easy to understand unless you know uh, some more about uh, the Word of God. Uh, so we've read out of the Word of God what faith is, uh, but that doesn't mean that, every, that you automatically understand everything there is to know about faith. So I changed my title, okay? Four questions about faith. Uh, so, uh, but I, I, I'm going to be honest here, and you know every time a Baptist preacher says this, you know, you think he's lying. But... Honestly, I don't, as far as my usual notes and things that I have written down, this is one of the shortest sermons, I'm being honest, it's one of the shortest sermons that I have, that I've preached in a long time. Now, when I was young, and I had my first sermon on paper, handwritten notes back in my office back there, and uh, my daughter actually put it in a plaque for me, and uh, there's probably not 150 words on that whole notes, you know. But my mind can't recall like that, so I have to write a lot more down. But still, it's, for, it's, it's very short. I can't promise you it's going to come out short, okay? <laughs> I wrote it down short. But I don't know how it's going to come out. Uh, four questions about faith. Now, let's get a... I usually give a little introduction in, in my sermon to, to get... Uh, I want to get everybody, like I said about the singing and everything, to get our mind where it needs to be. And, uh, you know, you, and even in a sermon, you can't have your mind on the whole Word of God, right? Not all 60. So I try to, through an introduction, to draw you down to a certain point uh, to where uh, you can follow, uh, you know, my, my effort a little bit better. Uh, but although faith is simple, it's not simple to explain. And there's a lot of things in the world that's, that's simple. Now, uh, you learned in, in school, and you already knew it, uh, but you breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide. That's simple, right? Now, Matt, I want you to come up here and explain that. Now. <laughs> you, you know, and it's simple. We do it every day, and there's no effort whatsoever, right? I mean, somebody could knock you out, and you're still going to breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide. And you studied in the school. Uh, most likely, you had a little bit of biology anyway. You studied in school that uh, uh, an amoeba. Remember studying about the amoeba? Looking at it through the little uh, uh, microscope. And if you were fortunate enough, you could actually uh, see it. And they showed it to you on, uh, well, I started to say show it. They didn't have films when I went to school have film strips. Click, ding, click, ding. And if you're under 45 years old, you have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> but some of you do. But anyway, an amoeba is a single-celled animal, and it just, it just splits into two, right? So you can't get any simple than that. Brother Eddie's going to come up and explain that one to you. <laughs> well, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be something if people just did that? Look around and see who you're glad that that don't happen, doesn't it? They just sort of pop in the two. Uh, but one simple fact, everyone here today is either saved or lost. 
You can't, you, 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 can, you, can't break it, you can't bring it down into a single cell like an amoeba. It's two cells, saved and lost. If you're saved, when you were saved, you experienced faith. You didn't get saved without faith. You can't get saved without faith. The Bible tells Ephesians 2 and 8. And, and you hear that if you've been in church in length time, you've heard this verse over and over and over. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So it's faith. God provided that grace. He provided the sacrifice. And by faith we believe what God did. That is the faith that brings us to salvation. But as true and pure as that faith was, when you were saved, that faith was true. It was pure. There was no, uh, nothing defiling about that faith whatsoever. It was true. It, it, if it wasn't pure, then it wasn't faith. It was true and pure, but as true and pure as it was, it was still a very rudimentary understanding of faith, a very basic form of faith. But we want to go a little bit beyond that today. And if you're saved and living for God for a long time, you've come to a much greater understanding of this. And you know, you understand faith a little better than that. But I want to go back today to that rudimentary, elementary understanding of faith that you experienced when you got saved, that I experienced when I got saved, that every person experiences when they get saved. And to help you do that, to help us do that, I'm going to preach today as if nobody here is saved. Yeah, I got because I want everybody on that same level. Even if you are saved, I want you back to that point in your time, in your life, back to that point when you got saved. So, in your mind, if you're saved today, whether it was this year, last year, fifty years ago, next year I'll celebrate being saved fifty years. It's hard to believe I'm only forty-eight, but <laughs> but but in your mind now, go back in your mind and recall that moment that you got saved and when you're and I said a while ago there's two cells in this thing we call life saved or lost lost or saved however, whichever one you want to put first there's only just two one month if you're saved today there was a time in your life when you were lost and there's a moment right there and you're saved it wasn't a long period of time. I like to go, when we go to the coast, and we usually go in the winter, we just like to see the water and hear the water and watch the sunrise. And, and it aggravates me. You, you look on, you know, you can get your phone out and you know, see when sunrise is. And, and sunrise, well, you see that sun an hour before sunrise. You see the light coming around. And then you see it up. And, and you know, it's hard to say, well, what moment is sunrise. Well, they've got it figured out. I don't know how they did it, but they, you know, it said, I guess they're right. And, uh, but that's not the way salvation, there wasn't a long period of time where you got, you, you know, you wasn't uh, 15 and then and by the time you was 18, all that process of time, you was getting saved. No, you was lost. There was a moment where you received Christ and you were saved. Right. Well, today, I want you to go back in your mind if you're saved, go back to that moment of time. In your mind, and I want you to be there today, be thinking about it, remembering it, rehearsing it, and reliving it in your mind as we go through the sermon today. So take, your, take yourself back in your mind to that day. I know, Eddie, that's a long, long time ago for you, 100 and how many? <laughs> but still go back to that time. Also be praying for those that may be here and have never experienced that moment. If you're lost, you've never experienced that moment. You may have, what do you, you may be thinking in your mind, what, what do you mean moment? What are you, what are you talking about a moment? A moment, don't, no, a moment, moment don't save you, but you're saved in a moment. My moment is August of 1973. Friendship Baptist Church. Elkin, North Carolina. And you might not know where Friendship Baptist Church is, but half of you in here know where Friendship Speedway is. It's right beside it. Friendship Speedway wasn't there when I got saved. But the church was there. Are you at your moment? Are you at your moment? 
Four questions about faith. Number one, what is it not? So we need to get what a lot of people think about faith and being saved and, and uh, being a Christian is all about. We need to get this one thing out of the way first. What is, what is faith not? Faith is not law. You can say law was bad, but faith is not law. Galatians 3 and 11, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live by faith. If you're trying to get to heaven by living by the law, you're not going to make it because you can't do it. Verse 12 says, And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. Now you say, Preacher, you just said the law was good, and now you're saying there's a curse of the law. What well, is a curse of the law? Because you can't live it. If you, can be, if you can live the law perfectly, then you can go to heaven without faith. But the curse is you can't do that. Christ hath redeemed us from the curses of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So Christ went through that curse. He did something for us at Calvary that we cannot do for ourselves, and that was he fulfilled the yes. law. Yes. Every jot and every tittle of the Bible tells us that he fulfilled the law. I was speaking with a man of his station the other day, and he uh, uh, a lot of the things that he believes and that we don't we don't believe, and uh, he he went through the plan of salvation, and he, he was he was very good until after the part that he got. He said, "Where you trust Christ as your Savior, and and then you know then it was no, there's no and, there's no and after faith. It's it's a moment." It's not that you go through these things and uh, of, of learning about Christ and, and being saved, and then later on you're there. No, it, it's a moment when you trust Christ as Savior. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. See, the law was a curse because we couldn't live it. But he did live the law. He fulfilled the law and died on the cross for us. And we'll get a little more about uh, what, why that means salvation for us in just a little bit. But Galatians 3 and 24, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to cry, unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith, but after faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Now, you, uh, to understand that, you have to have a, a little bit of understanding of what he means by schoolmaster. Uh, back in that day, the uh, better-to-do Greeks and Romans uh, had a, uh, somebody that lived in their house, usually a slave, that would bring up their young male children and teach them. And that was their schoolmaster. And uh, I, li I like the word, the Greek word for it. I don't know if I'm saying it right, but I think it puts, in a, puts me in a little better mind of, of what a person like that would be. It's called a, a pedagogue. You know, if your dad said, you go in there and you do what the schoolmaster says, you say, okay. If he says, you go in there and do what the pedagogue says. <laughs> you know, you, you sort, of pick, sort of, well, I better do that. But he was under the rule of that schoolmaster as a child. And he was, of course, the schoolmaster was taught in what to train that child, that young male child, and he was brought up, and he had to follow what he said. He had to do what he said, and he was taught that. But then there come a time where he become an adult, and he become a man. And he was no longer under the pedagogue, but he had the relationship with the father. He was a son. No longer just a child, he was a son. And that's what the law does for us. It points us and shows us where we're wrong. And it shows us how we should live. But until we come to the point where we come to that relationship with Jesus Christ as a son of God, 
We don't have anything. We just have regulations and rules. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So that doesn't let, there's, doesn't leave anybody out. The law only gets everybody. No one can keep the law. The law shows us that we have sinned, and Romans 3.23 tells us, for all have sinned, all, all. There's no, that's not one of those words where you have to look up two or three to get the understanding of it. It's just all. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's no sin in heaven. You're not going to take any sin in heaven. Then Romans 6 and 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the wages is death. That's what we have to pay. But Christ has already paid that sin debt on the cross. He died for us. He shed his blood on the cross and died for us that we may have faith in him in what he did for us and the fact that he fulfilled the law for us and trust in him and ask him to forgive us of our sins. So the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And this is where you get lost and saved. The wage of sin is death. That's all, everybody. Unless they come into knowledge of Jesus Christ and receive him as Savior, and then they have eternal life. Romans 10, 9 said that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in, the heart, in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Faith is believing in what Christ did on the cross. Believing. Faith. I used to do an illustration a long time ago. My son is 30 now. He was a little about that tall used to do a little illustration where I would take an electrical cord out of a box, cut the end of it off, strip the wires down, plug it into a socket, and I would tell him, come and grab these wires, it will not hurt you. And he would do it. And it didn't hurt him. Because he had faith in what I said. He didn't know why. He didn't know that I had went in from the other end and cut the wires inside and there was no connection to the electrical current. He knew I said it will not hurt you. And he had faith in what I said. When we look at Jesus Christ on the cross and trust him as our Savior and ask him to forgive, that's, that's faith when we do that. Just like my son would grab those wires because he had faith in me. We had to have faith in what Jesus Christ did on the cross. If you were saved, the law, the word of God, taught, taught you you were a sinner. And that punishment was eternal death. But it also taught you that by trusting in Christ, you could have eternal life. The law brought you to that moment. Right? Without the law, you'd have never got to that moment. You'd have never knew you were a sinner. You'd have never knew you needed to be saved. So the law was our schoolmaster. The law brought us to the knowledge. The law brought us to that moment when we knew that Christ died for our sins. And we received him as our Savior. So faith is not law. Number two, who do we have faith in? Now, it... it it's not enough just to have faith in somebody because somebody said it's okay, right? A lot of times, uh, there's, there's people in my life that, that if they said, if they knew somebody that I didn't know, and they said, you can trust him, I'd trust him, automatically. i just trust him, whatever he said. He said, whatever he says, it'd be right. I trust him. I know there's people that I know that good. But that don't work with salvation. That has to come from the word of God. It's not because of 
I as a preacher said it or somebody else said it, the Sunday school teacher said it, but it's because the Word of God said it. In Mark chapter 11, <clears throat> Peter is astonished in the fact that a lively fig tree completely dried up in one day. Mark eleven twenty one. And Peter, calling to remember it, saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. Now, they had went by the fig tree one morning. Uh, there was no figs on it. And Jesus cursed it. And they went through and they uh, had their day's activities and come back through. And then the next morning they come by that tree again. It was completely dried up to the roots. And Jesus answering and saith unto him, Have faith in God. And so Peter's wondering, how, how did this happen? How, how, does, how, does, how does something like that happen in our, our lives? How, how, can, how does that happen? He said, Jesus, have faith in God, just by faith. How, how do we walk the Christian life? How do we live the, by faith? By faith. You can do it on your own, much harder, much, much harder. But you can. You can, you can live after you got saved and do it on your own. Much easier once you... Learn to live by faith. As we go through life, we have problems and struggles. And what do we, what do we trust in to fix these problems? I mean, we have obstacles, problems. What are, what are you going to call them? Uh, we have problems. What do we put our faith in to fix these problems? Now, most of the time, I can say for men most of the time, and probably for women too, most of the time, you try to fix it yourself. And really, you say, well, it's so small, I don't even think about uh, what God would have me to do. A lot of things, we need to think about what God would have us to do. We just do it automatically, and we get ourselves messed up. We, we, we create problems sometimes, or make problems worse. I remember it's still years ago, and they had just come to, to visit with us here uh, this, a week or two ago. And uh, my, our niece was, I guess, a young teenager at the time, and her dad had bought her a new bicycle. And they were, they were down there from Kentucky, but they were here visiting us. And he's, he's not mechanical, okay? He's, give it to him in a box, it'll stay in the box. It's not going to get put together. And it, it, he knows that. He'll, he'll tell you that right at the start. He's just not. So he asked me to help him put it together, to, to put it together. So, yeah, so we're in Sheila's or Mama's living room, and I'm putting it together, and I'm doing, you know, and I don't know, uh, reading instructions and everything, putting this part, this part, this part, and I say, Joe, hand me them handlebars, because he's holding handlebars. And so I start to put the handlebars through the loop, and he stuck the grips on them. It don't go. If you ever put it back together, those grips don't go through there. He said, oh, here, let me pull them off. No. That was good grips. <laughs> we cut them off. But see, that's what happens sometimes. You know, and he was just saying, he said, well, I can do this. Well, he could. He did a, he, I tell, I've never seen anybody put grips on better than he did. <laughs> he had them on there. But sometimes we try to fix a problem and we make a mess. <clears throat> What a mess we make when we try to do the least little thing without God. If we can't fix it, the government will help, right? That's a big problem. I can't handle it, but the government, we'll get the right person in office, and, and all this is going to straighten out. It's not going to straighten out. So, well, if I just had enough money, I could fix the problem. No. Nothing works, but we keep trying to, to fix the problem. Keep trying to fix the problem. 1 Corinthians 2 and 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Many times in the Bible you say, well, well why did that happen? Why, why did God tell us about that? He wants us to see the power, his power, and what he did. And he wants us to understand that he, can, he still has that power and he can work things in our lives the same way. You look at things, you look, the, just for instance, the miracles of Elijah and Elisha, and you look at those miracles and say, well, that can't happen. That's impossible. Well, if it was possible, it wouldn't be a miracle. But God did things in there. 
And, and there's one thing, and, and Brother Barker mentioned something about this, and I, I knew exactly how he felt. It was a different problem. But I can't remember. He had some kind of illness, he said, and it, and it happened more than once where that when he would get to the pulpit, he was fine. He could, whatever the problem was, he didn't experience until he walked away from the pulpit when he was finished. And, and I can witness this, and I used to have a lot more headaches than I have now, and I get migraines, and, and if you ever had a migraine, you know what I'm talking about. If you've ever had a bad headache, you sort of know what I'm talking about. And if you hadn't ever had a headache, like some people tell me, I don't like you. <laughs> but the first time it happened, I didn't know if I was going to be able to preach. I had a migraine, pastor, and it was time for me to preach where we were going to church then. And I didn't have this. But I opened up the Bible and started to read the scripture. Headache's gone. Gone. Gone, gone, until I got done. And I honestly thought I wasn't going to be able to walk down off the platform. It would just come back. That's, that's, the, that, that's not a big miracle if you want to rate miracles. But to me, that is something that I absolutely know other than salvation that God has done for me. Several occasions he did that for me. But God can take care of the problem. Because that's one of the things that helped me know, hey, if he can take that headache away, he can, nobody else can ever take him away. He can do things that I really should put faith in him. Isn't it amazing that as Christians we act like we don't know who to turn to? Oh, don't get wrong. No, we take it to God. Lord, show me how to fix this problem. Now, you think, you think that sounds good until you think about it. Lord, show me how to fix this problem. Lord, show me what to do. We're still trying to fix it. You can get down here and come to the altar and pray. And pray, Lord, I want you to Lord, show me how to fix this. And you get assurance that, that you know, you feel like, well, I, you know before you come down that the Lord can show you how to fix it. You know he knows how to fix it, so you ask him to show you how to fix it, and you get back up and it don't get fixed. Next time, try this. Come down to the altar. Lord, take care of this problem, please. And you trust in that. You grab hold of those two wires. It'll work every time. Sometimes we'll carry a burden around for years and we'll try this and we'll read religious books about it. We'll read the Bible about it. We'll see instances in the Bible where, where this helped and maybe in that situation and we'll try that and we'll do this. But we won't say God take care of it. He just... He, hey, I could go down to the mat. Bro, Matt, come up here. Come for just a second. This is, this, you don't have to explain to me, but I'll we'll forget you that. So I'm going to hand him a Bible. Matt, take his Bible. But I don't want to let go of it. And we come to the altar. Thank you, brother. We come to the altar and we say, God, I need help with this. But we won't let go of it. We Letting go is faith. Letting go of our problems, that's when we show our faith in God. Number three, how do we get faith? <coughs> That's another one of them things that the Bible gives us a, a very clear definition on. How do we get faith? Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's absolutely 100% true. You don't hear the word of God, you don't have faith. Because right. you don't hear the word of God, you don't hear the law. You don't hear the law, you don't know you're lost. You don't, hear, you don't, you don't know you're lost, you don't get saved. Right. 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 <coughs> Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 21. Both, but to Israel, he saith, All day long I have stretched forth my hands 
unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Now, back in the Old Testament, God spoke through his prophets, and he would give them the word, and when they followed what the prophet said, everything went great. But then they'd get tired of that, and they'd go off and, and sin, and everything would get messed up. And God said, I'm giving you the word of God all day long. I'm stretching forth my hand. My prophets are telling you what to do. My prophets are proclaiming the word of God, and, they're te- and, you, and you won't do it. <clears throat> when I trusted Christ as Savior, when I come to the understanding that I was lost, and when I experienced that moment, it was actually the first time that I understood the gospel. It wasn't at that very moment that I first understood it. It was the next day at church. For some, God called many times before that moment came when they trusted Christ as Savior. They knew they were lost, maybe weeks, maybe months, maybe years. And the Holy Spirit spoke to their heart many times and brought them to that point where if they would just trust in Christ, they could be saved. And eventually, they finally, they trusted Christ. That moment came in their life. Now, remember, I'm, I want you to be at that moment. Are you at your moment? You're still at your moment when you got saved? <clears throat> Sadly for some, the Lord calls and calls. Then he calls no more. And that moment never comes. The moment never comes when, they take, when God takes their sins away. The moment never comes when they realize that they're going to heaven. When they realize, remember, they've heard the gospel. They know they're lost, but they just won't believe. They just won't trust in Christ as Savior. Remember to stay in your moment. Number four, where do we get faith? Where? Do we get faith? Hebrews 12 and 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. The Bible says Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. Our faith rests completely in Christ. You go outside of Christ, it, it, it's, it's not saving faith. It might be agreeing with the Word of God and agreeing with this. Just like that gentleman told me the other day, he had to plan a salvation cr- completely right. He said, First, you got to know, first, you got to hear the Word of God, he said. I said, That's absolutely right. Then you got to realize yourself a sinner. I said, That's absolutely right. And then you got to realize that Christ died for your sins. I said, that's absolutely right. And then you got to believe that he died for your sins. You recognize yourself a sinner, and you ask him to forgive you of your sins. I said, that's absolutely right. But then, then he added something to that. And that's what a lot of people do. They, they say, well, this part of the Bible sounds good, and this part of the word sounds good, and this part of the law sounds good. But I, I believe this too. Well, did Christ say it? He's the author and finisher of our faith. So if he didn't say it, it's not, is it? Jesus is not just the beginning of our faith. He is the finisher or the completer of our faith. Again, Ephesians 2 and 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. So where do you get faith? From God. Mark 9 and 23, Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. People get to that moment and they just don't believe. And say, how, how, how can I... Get that faith. Where does that faith come from? 
comes from God. It comes from God. The, the last person that I, I didn't really lead him to the Lord. He already knew everything he needed to do, but we, we talked. And it was that, it, he had been at that point for a long time when he just needed to have that faith to believe. And finally, he stepped across and understood that he didn't have to understand it all. He didn't have to know how God did it. Just like my son didn't have to understand how come that electricity wasn't coming out of that outlet. He just had to have faith and believe. If you wait till you understand salvation, you'll never get saved. But if you ask God to give you the faith to believe him, he'll do it. Now, I've asked you to keep in your mind the moment that you placed in your, your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior. And I hope you've done that. I hope you're doing it right now. You've got that, you've got that moment. Several times I ask you to think about that moment. Now my question is each time I mention that moment, did you have a moment to remember? If you don't have that moment, a time when you know that Christ saved you, you can trust him today. You can put that faith forth today. Your moment can be today. If we stand to our feet, Miss Susan comes to play. Now I have complete confidence in that, that many people here today are saved. And it would even be possible that everybody here is saved, but generally in a, in a congregation this size, there's people here that are not saved. There's people here that's never experienced that moment in their life. As I said, the moment for me was almost 50 years ago. The moment for some was this year. The moment uh, for some was all different times. We could probably go through here and, and just about get every year of the calendar back to the time I got saved and find somebody that was saved that year. That was their moment. But have you had that moment when you received Christ as Savior? I'm going to ask that all heads are bowed and all eyes are closed. Uh, this is a question for the individual heart. Today, do you, can you say, Preacher, I know, I know that there has been a moment in my life when I received Christ as Savior. Would you lift your hand? I know there's a moment in my life when I see, I know, I know, I know that I've been saved. There's a, been a moment in my life. You put your hands down. Now, I'm not going to embarrass anybody. There were several hands that were not raised. Several hands that could not say that I know that I'm saved. I know there's been a moment in my life where I received Christ as Savior. Now, I'm going to ask you now. You didn't raise your hand before, but would you be willing now to raise your hand and say, Preacher, pray for me, as that man did in the Bible, and ask God, help my unbelief. Would you be willing to lift your hand and say, Preacher, pray for me that God would help my unbelief, anyone at all. I'm lost. Help my unbelief. Would you be willing to lift your hand for prayer, anyone at all? Lord, we thank you for this day that you've given us. And Lord, we do pray, Lord, for those that could not lift their hand, that they've had that moment, that they're saved. But Lord, we don't, we don't put people in that moment. You do. And Lord, everyone here today, Lord, has heard the gospel. So Lord, they've heard the word. That's the first step. They've heard the word. Lord, but I can't even say that they got to the second step because I, I, I can't do that part. My part is to give them the word. That's what you have given us to do as your children. But Lord, I, I can't convict them of their sin. I can't show them and prove to them that they're a sinner. But Lord, I pray the Holy Spirit would. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit, Lord, would reach their hearts. And Lord, even as we're speaking, Lord, and show them that Lord, they're lost and they need to be saved. And Lord, if not today while they're here, but Lord, bring to remembrance sometime in the near future, Lord, where they see their need of a Savior, Lord, and they ask you to help their unbelief. 
and they receive him as Savior. In Jesus' name we pray.